I'm David. Um, I suspect some of you um, have heard of these projects already. I'm going to be giving a bit of an update on, on Yosis and XP and R, the um, two parts of the open source FPGA toolchain that I'm most, most involved in. Um, I last presented these to an Oshark meeting. Um, it was a bit over a year ago, about back when the world was a much more normal place, but um, I'll talk about some of the things that have happened since then and what's going on with that. So um, Yosis is an open source um, synthesis framework originally for Verilog synthesis, but it's now been extended to other things. It uh, supports synthesis for multiple FPGA families, um, most famously ICE40 and ECP5, the two lattice FPGAs with full open source tool chains. But um, Yosis can actually be used for a lot for just synthesis for a lot of other FPGAs too, like um, Xilinx, Intel, Microsemi. Go in and add logic. And uh, it's not just FPGA synthesis either. It can also be used for ASIC th synthesis, formal verification, and um, all kinds of other interesting things. So, uh, some of the interesting new features that have been going on in YOSIS recently. One of the big ones is uh, was led by Eddie Hung. It's called ABC9. ABC is the logic optimization and mapping framework that Yosis calls into internally to do things like mapping logic networks to LUT sufficiently. And um, ABC9 is a new interface to that mapping framework that gives support for things like better timing driven synthesis. So you can provide more accurate timing data for blocks inside your FPGA and then map to them more optimally, know knowing what those timings are. and um, ABC9 also adds some other interesting features like um, being able to do more advanced optimizations around flip-flops, possibly even retiming, which is moving flip-flops around to improve, improve the performance of a design. So um, this, this uses essentially a, a more advanced file format to interface for ABC in order, in order to get these features. And this has given quite a good improvement in quality for some ECP5 designs, I've seen the number of LUTs go down by 20 to 30 percent. So it's it's a big improvement in some cases. Another project that's just happened very recently is by White Quirk. She's worked on something called uh, CXXRTL. It's a C++ backend of sorts for Yosis. So instead of uh, synthesizing for an FPGA, you synthesize to a C++ simulation model. And it's uh, similar to what Verilator does, but it's built into Yosis and um, it, it has efficient support for things like multiple clock domains, combinational loops. And this is quite interesting for doing things like mixed language simulation, where you have multiple languages going into Yosis. So things like maybe mixing Yosis's Verilog front end with GHDL for VHDL synthesis and then using Yosis as a kind of combined simulator for all of these things. And um, on that note, um, one of the big developments that's been going on for, for Yosis recently is a, is a plugin for GHDL. GHDL is an open source VHDL simu simulator, but um, over the last couple of years, GHDL has also also gained synthesis support. So Tugin Gold has been working on on a, integrating that with Yosis. So um, this is still experimental, but I found I found the coverage is good. So I tried it out recently. I built the um, MIST SNES core, so that's an open source implementation of the uh, SNES game console on FPGA. That's written in VHDL. It was um, intended for Altera FPGAs, but I managed I managed to get that to to build using the entire open source flow using um, GHDL and Yosis. So interestingly enough, I actually found quite a few interesting bugs in GHDL while I was doing that, but I think um, all of those bugs were fixed within 24 hours, which which was very very impressive. So um, I'd like to see any closed source tool vendor achieve those kind of timeframes. But um, yeah, GHDL is definitely very interesting for, for those people that use VHDL, um, as we saw in the JCore presentation. So that's um, very, very nice that that's actually being used. So um, that was kind of an update on some of the things that have been happening with Yosis. I'm not so involved in Yosis development. I consider myself more of a user of Yosis than a, than a developer of Yosis. My, um, in fact, my day job these days of sorts is as the maintainer of NextPNR. NextPNR is an open 
open source um, PGA place and root tool. We started development on it back in about May 2018. So in software terms, it's still a fairly new code base. It's starting to become more stable, but um, it hasn't actually been in development for that long. And um, it's been an interesting journey so far. So it's um, unlike some of the previous things like Arachne PNR, it's, it's multi-architecture. It's not just designed for one FPGA family. It's designed to be a place and root solution for essentially any FPGA and possibly other programmable logic too. It's uh, really aimed from the from the ground up at, at, at generating bit streams for real world FPGAs. It's not an architecture exploration tool like something like VPR. It really is designed designed for real world use on real world FPGAs, including the more advanced functionality of those FPGAs. We designed next PNR to be timing driven from the start, so both the place at, place around the router use um, use timing input to um, to make decisions. So that gives you um, a be better timing in the output netlist, unlike unlike some of the previous work. And um, we've also designed next PNR to be very extensible and easy to experiment with. And one of the ways we've done that is exposing all of the internal APIs via Python bindings. So um, instead of having to hack the C++ core, you can develop new algorithms and new architectures um, just, use it, just using this Python interface. So um, the kind of current status of where Next PNR is at the moment, um, we have stable device support for ICE for, Lattice ICE40 and DCP5 devices. So when I say stable, people are even using this to build commercial designs, production designs. It's had quite a bit of end use now, and we still certainly have bugs, and it's not got every feature the vendor tools have, but, but it's definitely useful for end users if you're not a, if you're not a developer uh, and really interested in hacking the tools. It's something that you can really get started with straight away. It's um. Yeah, I mean, obviously, bug reports are always welcome, though. Um, no software is ever is ever perfectly stable or perfect. On the on the more experimental side, over the last year, I've been working on on Xilinx support. That's still very much not end user ready. It's not like the ICE 40 and ECP5 support. If you want to if you want to try out the Xilinx support, then unfortunately, that's still currently in a, in a state where you need to have a bit of an understanding what's going on, and it's. Um, you're going to hit quite bad bugs quite quickly, basically. So, um, yeah, but that, that's what I'm working on at the moment. And there's also a, um, a Python interface for, as I, as I mentioned before, for adding, adding new FPGAs quickly. But again, that, that's more, ex more experimental. So in terms of kind of scalability of Next PNR at the moment, Currently, we uh, have extensively text tested Next PNR on designs of the sort of 100,000 LUT order of magnitude. So the biggest DCP5 is about 80,000 LUTs. And um, we've also done some testing to make sure the core algorithms can scale on Xilinx devices and, and things work well up to about the 100,000 LUT mark. And that already gets you some pretty complicated FPGA designs. So we have things like DDR3 memory controllers like DRAM, gigabit Ethernet controller, 64-bit system on chip. So you can easily put, put all those three together on a big ECP5, say a 64-bit rocket core, DDR3 memory, gigabit Ethernet, and run Linux on that. And that's all, that's all working well. And, and that's kind of about the limit of where next PDR is at the moment that, that's stable and you'd want to use. So um, in terms of the algorithms that NextPNDAR provides, we have um, two placement algorithms, an analytical placer and a simulated annealing placer. The um, analytical placer is so much faster that there's very little use for the simulated annealing placer now. The uh, analytical placer is by default enabled, and that's somewhere between 10 and 20 percent 10 and 20 times faster, in fact, than, than the simulated annealing placer. So that's very, very useful even for big ECP5 designs. You can usually build them within about five minutes. We have two different routing algorithms. Both of them are congestion based. I'm going to talk a bit about the newer router. I've been working on router two, which is the second of those two a bit later on. And the um, 
packing part of the FPGA flow is currently there's no generic packing in Next PNR. That's done on a per architecture basis. But um, one of the other things I'm going to talk about in terms of new placement algorithms is actually moving away from the traditional packing step before placement and doing the bulk of packing as part of as part of placement. So you have more flexibility to, to move things around during placement. So I mentioned a bit about 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 the experimental Xilinx support. That's one of the new features that I've been working on recently. That's, uh, as I said, not yet upstream. It, it's not in the master branch. It's actually in a separate repository at the moment because it, it's not it's not at the level where we want to sort of really be encouraging fast use of this yet. Anyone who's looked at a Xilinx FPGA will know how complicated that is. So. We, it still needs a lot of work to get that into a state where it's where it's production ready in the same way that the ICE40 and ECP5 flows are. So um, the Xilinx support can actually interface with two other open source projects. RapidWrite is a is a project by Xilinx Xilinx themselves to open up open up Vivado a bit. So it's a it's a Java interface to Vivado that um, lets lets you ac access designs at a low level. So um, that gets us support for Ultrascale Plus, but as I say, that's using RapidWrite, so the bitstream generation is not open source. The bitstream generation is still done by Vivado. We, we just provide the place and route and the synthesis. That has its pros and cons. Obviously, the downside is that you still need Vivado, but the upside is it's a very good way to test the place and route side of things without having to worry about whether the bitstream documentation is accurate whether there might be bugs in your bitstream documentation and you can even do things like compare the timing analysis in next pndr against the timing analysis in vivado to make sure that um, your timing data is correct but we do also have the option of a fully open source flow for xilinx project x-ray provides bitstream documentation for the seven series devices primarily the arctic seven that's a Symbi flow project, and Next PNR Xilinx can also interface with that. Project X-Ray itself is still quite experimental, and it doesn't have documentation for the whole chip. Parts of the DSP are missing, the transceivers are missing, but um, it certainly provides enough bitstream documentation that um, you can demo things again, like the DDR3 controller built using a built using a fully open source flow. It's um, yeah, it's highly experimental. I keep saying that, but um, yeah, it's um, it's quite painful to get get a stable flow working for um, Xilinx devices. They're a heck of a lot more complicated than the ECP5 and the ICE40 that we've been playing with up till now. But um, we're starting to make starting to make progress on, on implementing features and improving that. And hopefully, by certainly by by the end of the year, this will be something that's in a much better position. Um, but actually, the biggest issue and what most of the rest of this presentation is going to be talking about is getting the runtime scaling better for larger devices. So as I said, next PNR, it's currently good to sort of the 100,000 LUT kind of kind of space. But if you look at the really big Xilinx FPGAs, they go well beyond a million LUTs. I've got one sitting sitting in a box next to my desk that's about two million LUT sixes in it. So that's a that's a serious challenge to be building building bit streams for and placing and routing for. So um, that needs a lot of improvement in the core algorithm still. And that's probably what I'm going to spend most of the rest of this year working on is is, in, is really improving that and getting the scaling there that we can really support any FPGA. So um, this is just a bit of an overview of, of when XPNDAR sits in the ecosystem. So we have Yosis for synthesis and then various other projects for bitstream generation like um, IceStorm and Trellis for the ICE40 and ECP5, Project X-Ray, the open source Silent 7 series bitstream flow, and then RapidWrite and Vivado for the ultra scale plus at the moment. So um, just a bit of a look inside next PNR to give a bit of a better better idea what's going on for some of the more detailed discussions about the algorithms inside it. So um, 
one of the big differences between Next PNR and most other attempts at place and route tools is that inside Next PNR, each, each FPGA architecture has its own chunk of code, not, not just an XML file or some other kind of data file. So this means architectures can implement very complex constraints, which real world FPGAs have. They can provide their own their own logic, um, arbitrarily complex logic as needed, and things like their own custom bitstream generation code, their own design rule checking, uh, custom custom packing and, and and netlist modification. Things like handling global clock networks, which vary quite a bit between different FPGAs. These are all the kind of reasons why NextPeer architectures have to provide quite a good chunk of code to do these kind of things. And um, NextPeer isn't designed just to provide a single placer and router either. It's um, very much designed to provide a choice of, of placer and route algorithms because um, in the long run, ideally we would have a trade-off. So we would have things like place and route algorithms that are very, very slow, but give very, very good quality of results. And maybe place and route flows that are very fast, but um, not so good quality of results for doing rapid prototyping on, on big FPGAs, for example. Uh, so this is a bit of a look at, at the flow inside NextPNDAR. So um, you would start off with the JSON front end, and then you go into any kind of packing that the architecture provides. So anything that's architecture specific has has the red dashed outline, and anything with a solid black black outline it is something that's fixed inside NextPNDAR and not necessarily architecture specific. So um, once you've gone through packing, then you go into the um, one of the places inside NextPNDAR. And that's also fed with um, information about the chip, so placement locations, placement constraints um, from the architecture. And it also interfaces with timing analysis. And the timing analysis is provided with a timing model by, by the architecture. Once placement's done, then you, then you go into routing. Um, and that, again, takes advantage of, of timing and chip data from, from the architecture. And finally, once routing is done, then you're probably going to go into some kind of architecture specific device export. So that would be things like an ASC file for the ICE 40 uh, to use with IceStorm, um, a, a text config file for ECP5 to use with Project Trellis, or a FASM file for Xilinx to use with Project X-Rays tools. And um, actually, FASM hopes to be a, gener a generic uh, bitstream format. So eventually, this architecture-specific export step might be replaced by something more generic. But the idea of next PNDAR is there's a lot of flexibility for, for, for making these decisions. And maybe more of these architecture-specific things can become shared between architectures as things settle down and as we become more comfortable with various design decisions. So uh, I mentioned a bit brief and briefly that I've been working on improving the routing inside Next PNDAR. So um, Router 2 is a new congestion-driven router based on an algorithm called C-Route Connection Route by Ghent University. It uh, uses a very classic negotiated congestion algorithm, which is essentially a star-based routing, but you allow multiple multiple nets to share a resource during the early phases of routing. So you initially obtain quite a congested solution where there are actually overlaps, which of course aren't allowed in hardware. But then you assign a, a penalty to those overlaps. It's an iterative process that continues until there are no overlaps. Um, and you also add a kind of historical penalty. So if, if, an, if, if a routing resource was overlapped a lot of times in the past, then that becomes very expensive to use in the future. And this is pretty much the classic FPGA routing algorithm. And what we've done is just a kind of spin on that that um, should hopefully improve the scaling of routing a lot. So unlike the previous router in NextPNDAR, Router 2 also adds parallelization. It's a region-based parallelization. So at the moment, we squ split the device up into quadrants. And then when we look at any kind of connection that doesn't cross quadrants, then um, then that each quadrant can have its own thread. And those 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 connections that we don't think will interfere with each other can just be contained to one of these four threads. Um, obviously, some 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 connections are very long. They cross the whole chip and those can't be single threaded. But in a typical design, there are relatively few of them. So this this multi threading approach already means that the bulk of the routing work can be done in parallel. 
and this could be extended further into more regions than just four for very big FPGAs going forward. So this is kind of an illustration of how we can um, parallelize these short connections based on based based on a heuristic as to whether whether they will um, need to cross thread boundaries or not. And then um, if they do, then we abandon trying to route them in a multi-threaded way, and anything that does need to cross boundaries will be dealt with separately um, after the multi-threaded part in a, in a separate single-threaded pass at the end. So the green the green boxes are essentially threads, and you can see the the multi-threaded part on the left and the single-threaded part on the right. So um, one of the other things that I've been working on inside Router 2 is actually uh, being able to make parts of the routing architecture specific. So um, an important one is being able to split um, split split arcs up into um, segments so that um, you can do things like clock buffer insertion in um, in an arch architecture specific way. And you can also route specific arcs in an architecture specific way as well. So um, for example, to do um, constant routing on Xilinx FPGAs for, for some particular obscure reason. When you're in a Xilinx FPGA, you actually need to um, do a lot of connecting ones and constant ones and zeros around. And um, there are a lot of those and it becomes quite expensive to use generic routing algorithms for that very specific problem. So um, I implemented just for Xilinx a specific pass that the router uses just, just for those connections. But um, this could be used for all kinds of other things as well, where just some subset of connections need to be dealt with in an, in an architecture specific way. Um, so um, again, you can also, the architecture can also break routing arcs into smaller segments, and this enables the use of dedicated routing resources for um, optimizing things. So, for example, um, inside the ultra scale FPGAs, there are lots of there are lots of dedicated resources for routing signals that have a high fan out that have a lot of connections on them in a small area. So. Um, we can we can use it for that and also again in the big ultra scale fpgas they have um multiple logic regions and um this approach can be used to um take advantage of the special resources used to cross those logic regions which actually dies in their own right attached to a um attached to a kind of substrate and um also special casing things like um funny input output structures and fpgas that um, unfortunately you often come to in the real world so all these kind of tweaks inside next pndr that we let these architectures provide are really important for being able to efficiently support the awful complexities of real world fpgas so um this is a bit of an example of how you might use um segments to force the force the use of a dedicated resource for um, a high fan out signal so if we have this um flip-flop connecting to lots of lookup tables um, instead of routing all of those connections just using regular routing resources which would be quite slow we um, use the segment approach to automatically insert in the architecture a specific resource called a buff leaf that um, essentially means all these all that you just route to the one, one primitive and then um, routing to all these LUTs actually essentially comes for free so this is the kind of thing that we can do to really improve next PNDAR for specific architectures. So um, that, that was the improvements in terms of making the router scale better to big devices, but um, the next problem has now turned out to be placement. So um, the current analytical place is not bad. The placer itself is very fast, but um, the quality of results the placer produces is not very good. It, um, if you look at a, it's good for a small design, but if you look at a bigger design, um, Actually, the placer starts placing things in a way that become very hard to root. And so um, that was really the thing that's now bottlenecking, being able to build really big designs efficiently with Next PNDAR. So uh, I did a bit of research into this, and it seemed like uh, one of the better algorithms out there was called Ripple FPGA. So this is actually routability driven placement. So it's placing the design in a way that attempts to ensure the root, routability is optimal, so it's as easy as possible to route later on. 
And it does this primarily using several heuristics that um, aim to reduce re routing congestion. So things like trying to estimate which parts of the chip will need a lot of routing resources will be very congested and then modify the placement so that you don't place as much things, as much stuff in that area. And um, it also replaces any kind of packing. So it does a kind of incremental packing and placement so that you have very fine grained control over placement. And I have a little illustration of that a bit later on. It uh, is actually quite similar to the uh, initial analytical place that we implemented inside an XP and DAR heap. It um, essentially is adding these new heurist heuristics to it to um, ensure optimal routability. So um, things like assigning this higher area cost to congested cells to make sure that we spread things out a bit more when we think there's going to be a highly congested routing. And um, it also does a partitioning at the start. Rather than just doing a totally random placement at the start, it does a partitioning step. So it's a sort of partitioned random random placement. So um, in this initial placement step as a kind of starting point for the other algorithms, things that belong together are already somewhat put together. And this um, this partitioning actually turned out to be an interesting sub problem in itself because it's um, an algorithm known as hypergraph partitioning. And this has quite a few other applications inside um, design automation type stuff. So a hypergraph is, um, is, is essentially what's shown here. It's like a graph, but um, each edge can connect to more than one vertex. So um, essentially a hypergraph is what's known to people in the kind of um, electronics world as a netlist, as a circuit. That's all a hypergraph is, despite, despite the fancy mathematical name. And um, partitioning it is simply trying to find a, um, a cut point in it that um, minimizes the number of connections that are crossing that cut point is, is the general general cost objective for partitioning. So this is a simple example of, of how you might partition a, a small hypergraph. Um, this would be the result that the hypergraph partitioner gave you is which, 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 which cells are on the left of the partition and which are on the right of the partition. So um, as well as being use useful for this one heuristic inside the Ripple FPGA placer, it's um, also useful for things like doing logic region partitioning for large FPGAs. So that's the thing I mentioned where you look at a big ultra scale FPGA and it's not just one FPGA die, it's actually four FPGA die put on an interposer. So you could actually use hypergraph partitioning to split the circuit up into those four die partitions before you even go into placement. This is also useful for parallelization because it attempts to minimize the amount of crossing you have between different parts, different parts of the design. And that's useful because then potentially you can send those different parts off into their own thread and each thread can be relatively self-contained. And um, in theory, hypergraph partitioning type algorithms could also be used for um, for um, doing things like um, splitting a splitting a design actually across multiple small FPGAs, like if you had four ice forty or so on a board and and you wanted to split a design across them, but uh, um, it uh, sadly turned out there wasn't actually a, a kind of nice, simple, easy to integrate hypergraph partitioner out there. So um, one of the most recent things I've been working on is uh, actually doing a a small open source hypergraph partitioner, and I hope to release that a bit more publicly quite soon in the hope that it will be um, useful for a lot of these other use cases and, and it could be quite an interesting thing to play with. So um, one of the other important parts of Ripple is this is this fine-grained pack and placement. So um, on the left is how the ECP5 flow used to look, for example. It, there would be this initial packing step that combined these small logic elements, the LUTs and the flip-flops, into a slightly larger element called a slice, which is essentially two LUTs, two flip-flops, and some carry logic. But um, actually, we've had to make some architectural changes to do things like the ripple placer. Um, that essentially means instead of placing these big monolithic slices, actually placement starts with these smaller blocks just straight away. So we have these LUTs and carry blocks and the flip-flops, and that should enable um, more advanced placement decisions because instead of having to combine things ahead of time into this slightly bigger block, um, the placer can really reason about things at, a, at the finest possible level all the way through placement. Um, so now, now the question is, what's next really for next PNR? So um, the most important thing is finishing off this this Ripple routability driven placer, and that's kind of my immediate task for the next couple of months.
then when that's done, the next step is going to be improving the timing constraints. In Next PNR, that's been a common pain point. People trying to do things like advanced uh, I.O. or multiple clock domains have found the timing constraint system somewhat lacking. And then when that's done, I hope to start looking at retiming, which is probably the last thing needed for Next PNR to be really, really useful on a big FPGA, is being able to actually um, move registers about to take advantage of um to, to, to minimize um, things like routing delays, but by taking advantage of the ability to move registers about to um, to um, balance out those delays. So th that's kind of my um, my rough my rough targets for next PRDAR going forward. So, so um, that's it. Um, any questions? Uh, thanks for that, David. Yes, we have got one question from uh, Jeremy Bennett. Um, he, he asks. Um, uh, are Lattice now engaging with the Yosis project? Uh, it is surely a great marketing opportunity for them. Um, so um, discussions for that are sort of ongoing, shall I say. Um, Lattice have finally made a, made a public statement in support of open source FPGAs after a bit of recent controversy. And um, yeah, I'm really hoping there can be some partnership there. But um, unfortunately, things things move slowly and I can't really have much to say yet but um you know maybe maybe hopefully in a few more months then then things will be in a better place there great um, um, sorry it's all a bit a bit vague and a bit um yeah these 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 things are complicated and yeah companies move slowly okay um that's it no more questions thanks for your talk um